Hello friends and welcome back to my shop. Uh, it's been a minute um, because I created one of these things, little happy human and uh, wife is perfectly healthy, baby is perfectly healthy and I've been spending time with them and slowly trying to arrange my life again so I can shoot more video and start working back right here and that's coming along wonderfully now. So uh, let's get back to our scheduled programming. In this week's video, I'm gonna go through the process that I use to, wrong pen, a lot of pens. Uh, turn this pen, which uh, looks silver now, this is actually a brass pen, uh, the process I use to nickel plate this. Um, there is a ton of stuff online how to nickel plate. It's actually a very easy process to do at home, but to do it well, uh, there's a lot, a lot of caveats and uh, caveats, caveats, cave anyways, there's a lot of issues. Um, and I finally found a system that works well for me. Uh, and obviously I would love to share it with you guys because that's what this is all about. Thankfully, as I was working through this process, I decided to shoot a ton of B-roll and just like on my phone and on this camera and just everywhere. Um, not a lot of narration, but that's that's what I can do now. I can talk you through my whole process, which is uh, which is the fun part. So the first step in this whole process is nothing to do with plating. Uh, these are actually the titanium pocket clips that I put on the pens. Um, I wanna bring them up to a pretty nice finish for the anodizing. The brighter the finish, the better the anodizing pops. Uh, so basically after these are machined, I just run these over some, uh, I think this was 600 grit wet sanding, uh, just to put a nice satin finish on it. And after that, I run them through buffing, um, just once again, to bring that finish level up nice and high so that when they do get anodized, they bing, shine quite nicely. And titanium, it can handle a lot higher finish without scratching just be because it's so much more hard. Uh, so once those parts were all out of the way, uh, the next part to start was the nickel plating. Uh, the first thing we have to do is make nickel acetate. And there's a load of tutorials online how to make it. Very simple, you basically just need nickel and vinegar uh, and a little bit of salt um, and a way to run electrical current through it. I won't go over it because that's, that's very simple. Um, but essentially what you're doing is you're putting nickel into solution, uh, the nickel anode or cathode, one of the two gets eaten away and then uh, you basically have nickel in solution, which is actually pretty poisonous. So just be careful with all this stuff that we're talking about. Use your own. You're, you're, uh, you're your own person. You can make your own safety decisions. Once we have that solution made, um, we're basically just gonna use electrical current to put whatever nickel is in solution back onto whatever metal we put in there. Uh, for the most part, nickel bonds to most things. Um, later down the line here, I'll talk about a different process I had to use to uh, further increase the quality of the product. But um, in this instance, we're basically just gonna put a very clean part into it. So I took my part and I just ultrasonic cleaned it and then I degreased it with acetone and we popped it in solution and just ran some tests on that. That worked okay. Um, I got a pretty decent bond on it, but to get a better bond, what you can do is uh, pickle the solution or pickle the part. Um, pickling is basically just etching the exterior of the metal, whatever you're putting in, um, just to give it more bonding strength, remove any oxidization, um, just, just, like, just like painting on whatever. Uh, surface prep is far more important than the actual application step. Uh, you spend a lot more time doing that. Uh, so what I ended up using was a uh, muriatic acid or basically another name for hydrochloric acid and uh, dunking the part into a dilute solution of that, um, which would essentially etch the uh, exterior of the part, help remove any other contaminants, and then uh, I nickel plated that. That worked significantly better, um, but I still didn't quite get the plating results I wanted. Uh, what I did is I actually, the first part unfortunately is once I thought I had a pretty solid solution, I ended up plating all the caps for a pen and then realized that the plating just wasn't at the quality I wanted. So I ended up garbaging about 10 uh, pen caps that uh, were perfectly usable, but it's besides the point. After that, I got smart and made a bunch of brass coupons uh, that I could plate and test. And then if I ruined those, I wasn't ruining a perfectly machined part. Uh, so that's what I did next. I made a bunch of brass coupons and I plated them in the same process. Um, varying the current and voltage level of my solution because that's very important to getting a good plating result. Basically, the faster you go, the faster you can plate, the poorer quality the bond is, the slower you go, the slower the plating, but the better the bond. So you kind of have to strike a happy balance. Uh, if you go too slow, it just, it still, it doesn't work. And if you go too fast, it doesn't work. So there, there's a happy medium. So I ran all the coupons through my test at varying voltage levels and kept track of everything and journaled it all in my in my book so I could actually see the results I was getting and see where they correlated and where the where the problems were. Um, I used a razor blade to try to scrape off any coating. Um, and honestly, most of them worked quite well. Um, once I got through that, then I used a file to try to really abrade. I wanna abrade the coating to the point where I can create an area where it'll lift um, because that's that's the problem with plating is you're, you're putting a coating of paint if you wanna think on a metal. Uh, and if your bond isn't good, it's just gonna flake off. The destructive testing went well, but it didn't go perfect. Um, there's 
I had great bond, but getting perfect uniformity or perfect uniform bond across the entire surface. Uh, on my little coupons, it worked great because they're so small. But when I started doing bodies, uh, which I don't have video of here, um, I did some larger tests and I found that I would get about 95% perfect plating results and then I'd have some minor problematic areas. Um, so I went down another path that I probably should have went down from the start, um, but I was trying to avoid it just because it's more work. Um, but what you do is you would copper plate metals first, and then you would nickel plate over the copper. The reason being copper bonds better to certain copper alloys. Brass that I use is, I believe it's a copper, it should be, yeah, it's a copper alloy. Um, so copper will have a higher affinity to bond to it. And then nickel bonds to copper better than just brass in its innate form. So doing that two stage process, you get a much stronger bond. Um, and I would, I hoped I would get a stronger surface, surface surface coverage, uh, spoiler alert, I definitely did, um, but that was the key solution. Speaking of solutions, that's what I had to make. Like that transition, that wasn't even planned. Uh, the next thing I had to do was make copper acetate. It's exact same as nickel acetate, except I wanted to have copper in solution so that it could bond to the pen first and then I could transfer it into the nickel plating solution and do that. Once again, lots of tutorials online how to make copper acetate. In this instance, I actually had concentrated um, hydrogen peroxide um, from my float tank days. I had 30% solution, uh, which is quite potent and dangerous on the fingers. Um, but basically mixing that with vinegar, um, I'm able to create a solution that super oxidizes copper. I put a bunch of copper into it. Um, so the hydrogen peroxide basically just kind of helps speed up the reaction. And then the vinegar just kind of corrodes the metal and you end up with a copper acetate. Uh, you can do it a bunch of different ways as well, but this worked well. I left it overnight. Um, with a bunch of copper pieces in the tank, and then uh, I just had a nice clean copper solution. All these solutions, once I was done with them, even the earlier nickel acetate one, I filtered um, basically through coffee filters after, just to clean it. Probably not required, but it's always nice starting with nice clean chemicals. The copper plating solution worked so much better. Um, basically what I did is I went through the same cleaning process. I slowly discovered that um, Cleaning is pivotal. I mean, I've been stressing it this entire video, but ultrasonic cleaning was good. Uh, what I ended up settling with was uh, something called uh, electro cleaning. It's, event it's essentially reverse electroplating. Uh, so I put the whatever part I'm gonna end up plating into another solution of uh, vinegar and salt, and I run the electroplating cycle backwards. So essentially what I'm doing is, uh, I'm not plating the product. I'm just trying to basically blast all the oxidization layer off of it. Um, I put it in there quite quickly and um, that basically just helps remove any oxides off the surface. So I figured out, I don't know, I'm reading, I'm a, don't trust me, I'm a guy on the internet, I don't, I'm not a chemist. Um, but this seems to uh, prep the surface a lot better. Once it's out of that solution, I immediately put it either into distilled water or into acetone, basically something just to keep oxygen um, and air and whatnot from oxidizing the surface. So I always keep it under a layer of either, yeah, like I said, distilled water, acetone, rubbing alcohol, basically something just to keep the parts submerged. Um, after that, it goes directly into my copper plate solution. I also figured out that running my solutions at temperature helps significantly. Um, it increases the thickness of the bond um, or increases the thickness of the plating, increases the strength of the bond and uh, increases the uniformity of the bond. Uh, so I put all my solutions into double boilers uh, so I can bring the temperature up while I was going through the plating procedure. Um, I won't give voltages and currents because Honestly, it is so specific to how strong your solutions are. For instance, on my copper plating, I'm using four volts, um, which seems to work really well. And I'm running that for like half an hour, depending on how many parts. I mean, the current regulates up for how many parts you have in the tank, but um, I run that for about 15 minutes and keep spinning parts around, um, flip them every 15 minutes. And for the nickel plating, I run it at about half that. I run it at about two volts, um, but this nickel plating solution is significantly stronger. If your nickel plating solution is weaker, you can run a higher voltage. So there's really no correlation to those numbers. Uh, it's just numbers I found useful. You don't want to go too high in voltage just because you'll start getting those weird like stalact stalactites, stalagmites kind of forming on your part. But yeah, voltages and currents are kind of pointless to anybody reading this. You kind of have to just go about your own way, depending on the size of the volume you're using, um, the volume of part. There is math that you can go through to try to figure this out. But honestly, the math is solidly complicated and it's probably not correlated perfectly. You're better just to run tests and tests and tests and tests and then find something that works. Cause that's what I did and I find that works better. So the nickel plating step was key uh, for my process. It just, it, everything worked better um, on the pens that I actually ran through the bath. Um, I don't even know if I have process on uh, pictures. Oh. This was actually 100, this is a dud, uh, but uh, it worked out really well. Unfortunately, this is pen 100 and it turned out to be a dud. There's a flaw in the plating because this was the first pen that I ran through the process. 
uh, so I'm just not comfy selling it. So uh, it gets to stick around with me, which is kind of cool because it's Pen 100, so yeah. Sorry if you wanted to buy that one. Just, just the way the cookie crumbles. Actually, it isn't a great pen. There's much better ones that I've built now. So yeah, that's what I'm doing. Anyways, besides the point, uh, like I said, copper plating worked great for me. A lot of people say nickel plating is kind of more magic than it is science. I don't mean to be a jerk, but I don't buy that. I mean, I think if you can account for everything, if you can account for temperatures and solution concentrations changing, changing and your wash possibly getting dirtier with time and your temperature of the room changing and your part temperature changing and the bath temperature, like. If you account for all of those variables and you try to keep them all in line, at least I've been able to get a fairly consistent result. I don't have a huge sample size yet, you know, 10, 20 units, um, but I'm pulling a really, really, really high um, level of uh, repeatability out of, out of my process. So I think it's more science than art, but your mileage might vary. Also those solutions, stupidly poisonous. Uh, not stupidly poisonous, but really bioavailable, so just be careful, don't drink them. Once we had that going, uh, the next step was to basically do the boxes. In the past, I had hand cut the little uh, cardstock pieces for all my boxes. Obviously, I'm not going to do that with like 20 or 50 boxes because it'll drive me crazy. Um, putting them in my laser is ideal. So I essentially printed it with some uh, alignment marks on it so that I could size the paper perfectly to the print because even if the paper went into the printer crooked, uh, the, the alignment marks would be in the same crookedness to the print. Uh, and then I use those alignment marks in the laser to basically cut all the parts. Essentially what I did is I just sheared the, the paper, the, the raw pieces to size by printing lines on them. Uh, nice easy cuts to make, straight cuts. Uh, and then I could put that in the, uh, in the laser aligned to a stop in the machine. And then I could just keep running boxes like that. So they're not perfect yet. Um, there's a little bit of variance between my laser and the printer, depending if the printer didn't pull it through perfectly smooth or whatnot, but it's close enough for my process to work uh, because it takes like seven or eight minutes to hand cut them and like 20 seconds to laser cut them. So yeah, that's the way I'm going through with it. I did like 20 or 30, I did like uh, 20 or 30 of these boxes and uh, they all came out quite nice. So that's, uh, that's key because now I don't have to worry about that. And then I built a jig so that I could actually bend them and not have to spend so much time measuring everything. Um, the smart among you might see that I could probably just ran my laser to make bend lines. But once again, I wasn't super confident with the way the uh, cutting was to the alignment of the artwork. Like I want the bend lines to line up right on the certain locations here. And I couldn't guarantee that when I first did this. So anyway, that's gonna take more tweaking. For this stage, I was happy just hand creasing them. Once again, it just, it saved me so much time Ha laser creasing them will be better, but I just one step at a time. I will eventually outsource this box making. People have sent me great emails with companies they use. Um, a lot of the companies I've got quotes from, uh, they're just the core charges for the uh, custom die cutting and then the print plate charges for like multiple color prints uh, just got really expensive, like thousands and thousands of dollars per color and then thousands and thousands of dollars per custom cutting. Um, so, I mean, you're looking at $10,000 for, you know, a small box run, it's just, it doesn't make sense. But there's much better solutions out there, companies that are maybe more forward thinking or have different equipment. Anyway, we're going down that road in the future. For now, this works. The very last step, uh, basically to get the pens out was to cut all the foam. That is super nice because the laser cuts foam wonderfully well. I basically just pop sheet after sheet into it and let it laser cut away. I then stacked them all onto giant pieces of foam board and spray laminated them together um, with a mask on one side just to keep the glue from contacting an area. Once again, this is, this is, <laughs> Seems like so much work focused just on like packaging, but in my opinion, that's the first thing you see. As soon as you open something, like you open, I've said it in the past, you open a phone, a phone is beautifully packaged. They could just wrap it in newspaper and send it to you as well, but it just doesn't convey the same. You don't get the immediate same feeling. Maybe it's not important to people. To me, I think it's super important to first impression is like the only impression you can make is uh, when you open something. And obviously I want it to be even better, um, but there, there's just that balance. So I'm, I'm doing the best that I can with the tools that I have. Uh, and, and I'm happy with it. I think they look really cool. Um, they'll get better with time, but yeah, that's, that's the reason I devote so much time to packaging and instructions and all that stuff. It's just cause it's important and it's the one 10 second chance I get as soon as you open one of my products to basically convey like, Hey, this was made with care and quality. Um, I could just as easy wrap in bubble wrap and throw it in a padded mailer and send it to you. I just, I don't choose to do that. And honestly, I like doing this. This is part of the machining to me. This is part of the overall product design. That's why I do it. I don't think I actually mentioned why I'm going down this uh, nickel plating rabbit hole. And that was to, where's the part? Right there. Um, that was to basically be able to do this. So here is the snap action cap. This one's in brass. If you look on the inside of it, you can see it's silver because that's nickel plating. Um, 
It's been nickel plated on the inside. Because of my testing, I've just found, uh, like in my last video, I was showing the brass capping and after 10,000 cycles, I was seeing wear, um, more wear than I wanted to see. Not detrimental, but more than I wanted. Um, and by adding nickel plating to it, it just basically like negated that. It just, it works so much better. The nickel plating over time just burnishes and then it feels better. And the durability is just way, way, way better. So uh, I wanted to run that through. And then I still wanted the exterior to be brass so I could do the weird kind of patina patterns and whatnot that I do. Or like this one and just go full nickel plating to make it all silver surfer style. Uh, yeah, so I'm very pleased with that. That's working quite well. Um, the first half of that batch sold like decently quick. Uh, I'll have the second half ready. Uh, that was the half that I ruined all the caps on. So uh, all the parts are machined. I just have to remachine the caps uh, and then uh, basically just clean them and I can host them on the website. So hopefully in the next couple of weeks, I'll have those up. Uh, thank you everybody who purchased the first batch. Um, yeah, you're, you're awesome. Everybody's awesome. You, just you watching, you, you make this, I, I'll, I'm gonna do this regardless, but uh, thanks for the audience. Once that's uh, up and ready to go on the site, uh, the next thing we're doing are the brass, not the brass, words. Uh, the next thing we're doing are the titanium minis. Um, I've had a bunch of emails of people requesting those. So the mini bolt actions in full titanium. Um, this is one of the titanium bodies. They're finally coming along. Obviously I need the big lathe running to do the drilling um, because drilling titanium this deep is still annoying for me, but it's uh, I have enough processes dialed in now where I can do a, a decently sized run of those and I'll be happy with them. Um, then we'll ream them. And the other thing that was bothering me is having the inside. I want the inside like a mirror finish. So I bought some of these um, diamond hones. I actually bought a bunch of them in different grits. Um, not cheap, um, but they should allow me to basically bring that finish, uh, the internal bore finish up to a mirror finish or very close to, uh, which will make the cycle just uber smooth. Uh, and then to add to that, uh, I also have a high voltage DC supply that should be here very quickly, um, which will let me do the um, anodizing on the titanium in the colors I wanna play with, uh, which are like lime green and pink. Um, I wanna make some just wildly neon uh, looking ones. We're gonna do some tumbled ones. Uh, I'm also looking at a process called vapor honing, which should put a really cool finish on it. But yeah, lots of fun stuff in the future. Stuff that I love working on. Um, stuff that you people seem, maybe not you, but some people uh, seem interested in. So uh, thank you so much for your interest. Thank, thank you so much for watching. And I will see you guys next time. Take care. Bye-bye. Soon enough. Not in like three weeks. Like, like soon again. We're back on schedule. Yay.